I think that for a while we've been focusing on, we need to make a change because it's better for women and girls. But the truth is, is that it's better for everyone. You're listening to Good Is In The Details. I'm Gwendolyn Dolsky. And I'm Rudy South. And this is the podcast where we learn what we didn't know we didn't know in the spirit of Socrates, all with an effort to live a better life, a healthier life, a self-improved life. Rudy, what are your thoughts on self-improvement? I can't get enough of it. I can't, I can't improve <laughs> myself. can't improve myself enough. And what's great about this episode is that uh, I am listening mostly on this episode because I'm trying to self-improve. Not that I need you know, self-improvement on the subject that we're talking about here. But this is one in particular where you really took the reins. And I think this is a great one for everyone to listen to, in particular, our male audience. And why is that? Yeah. Our guest is author of Equal Partners, Improving Gender Equality at Home by Kate Mangino. I came across one of her essays in Time Magazine and I reached out to her. I read her book. And yeah, this is a book about the domestic space and the amount of labor that takes place in the domestic space, which predominantly falls on women. We talk mainly about heterosexual relationships because there's just more data on that, but there is room to have discussions about same-sex relationships. And I found it really interesting because she, in her book, she's breaking down that we're not just talking about chores like who does the dishes or the laundry, but there's also the cognitive work and there's the emotional labor that still falls on women. But what's really cool, Rudy, you and I are part of the generation Gen X, go Gen X, that has made the most amount of improvement. Millennials have kind of fallen down. They they haven't done as much fallen down. I don't know if that's the right word. But we have made the biggest leap from the previous generation. Yeah, it's just a great, it's, it's also, yeah, it's also for dudes. Because when we talk about when you have more shared work at home and not just the chores, again, like dishes or whatever, but the cognitive labor, the emotional labor, that means like when somebody is sick, who do you take care of? Whose number is on record at the elementary school or at the doctor's office? Who's able to advance in their career or have time to go and exercise? So a lot of times women are doing so much work that they don't have this chance to get ahead. It turns out though, that when men are participating more in this, they have healthier and better relationships and even better sex lives. So it's a win. It's a win all around. I think you just gave a hint as to why I was so quiet <laughs> this episode. It's because you mentioned that word that I do not say. But that is one it's of the reasons Voldemort, why I stay so quiet. <laughs> it, might as, it might as well be. Well, you're really great. It's, I mean, it's true. You were, you were definitely a listener for this one. But then when you chimed in and we we're talking about your own experience between you know your relationship with your parents and then the way you are in your home, I think it's, it's, I'm really grateful that you're open and vulnerable about that. And you and your wife, Kate, obviously are just fantastic partners. And I'm also, I'm also looking forward to seeing or hearing what she has to say when she hears this. Yeah. You know, what I really enjoyed about this episode, I was a little surprised when I did actually pipe up, I was um, congratulated or thanked for being so honest about the fact that my wife and I, I was just blatant. I said, look, without domestic help, without the help that we have in our household, our careers, our everything wouldn't work. And I was just appreciative that she said, wow, that's really honest. You know? Yeah, good for you. Right. You And lo and behold, about a week later, I saw some LinkedIn post by um, like a, a very well-known career person and how she was saying that not enough people admit women in particular, feel scared to admit that they have domestic help mm. at home because they feel like that makes them less of a woman. I would just, people, could, I wish people could just be more honest, you know, just cut the bullshit. Like women, men, we, we need to work together. We need help. We both stand to benefit both economically and relationship wise if we both chip in and we shouldn't just be thinking about, you know, the uh, us as an individual, we should be thinking about the unit. So hopefully this episode helps out. With yeah. That. And it's just more happiness when, when both people are able to exercise their potential and their talents. It's also great for the children to see that it just makes them more present as parents. Absolutely. I completely agree. For sure. Okay. Let's talk gender equity in the domestic space with Kate Mangino. Kate, welcome to Good Is In The Details. 
I came across your essay in Time Magazine on the quiet quitting of household work, and I reached out to you, and thank goodness that you responded, and I got your book, and I'm in love with it. So I wanted to ask a little bit about your project with your work on gender equity and the domestic space. There is a lot of literature on this subject. What did you find was missing in the existing literature that you wanted to address? Absolutely. Um, Well, thank you for having me today. Thank you for reaching out. Um, And it's a pleasure to talk to you today. When I set out to write this book, you know, writing books, you don't really make any money off of writing books. And it's it's a ton of time. And so I thought very long and hard before I started into this project. And I think part of it was the frustration that I kept reading things in the media and, and I thought something was missing. So that's a great first question because I, I did think that there just was people were skirting topics and I really wanted to drill down into those. One thing that I think was missing is that this topic has lived in the nuclear heterosexual family with small kids for a very long time. And I think this is a topic that everyone needs to talk about. Whether or not you're in a partnership, whether or not you have kids, I think there's something that you can do. I think you can choose different words. You can choose a different attitude. You can be more supportive of people in your community and your family. So that was one thing that I thought was missing. Another thing is because it was stuck in heteronormative couples and data, I didn't think it was inclusive of gay and queer couples. So that was another step I wanted to take to really talk about partnership broadly, you know, and what are the universal truths that any two people have to tackle when they come together in a long-term relationship. And I think the third thing is that there was a lot of talk around sort of a woman's perspective, and there's a lot of negative literature about what toxic masculinity looks like and what men do wrong, the Harvey Weinstein stories that are out there. And that's important and accountability is great. But I also thought we needed more examples to normalize good behavior, to normalize equality. What does it look like when a guy is pulling half of his weight and really doing half the household work? There are those men out there, a lot of them. And I wanted to normalize those stories and set role models for people to follow. So I wanted to take an appreciative approach and really talk about aspirational masculinity as opposed to toxic masculinity. I loved the analogy that you had toward the beginning of in order to explain what it is in the domestic space in terms of this division of labor, that the male partner, and this is generally, I want to, I want to be careful with my language here, would be like showing up for a shift, whereas the, the woman is the one who's owning and running the business. So her mindset is to take care of everything constantly to make sure everything is running and the emotional and cognitive work that that takes. I thought it was a great parallel with a business owner as opposed to somebody who shows up for their shift and then they're good, they're done, and then they can go home. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, think about we've all done shift work at some point in our life and you show up and you you know, I waited tables all through college and you punch in and you do your dinner shift and you punch out and you go home. And after I left that restaurant, I wasn't worried about whether or not they were meeting their overhead or whether or not there was enough food in the freezer to take the the breakfast crowd. I didn't have to, that wasn't on my mind. I left, I had my money, I was free. Um, I could spend that time doing whatever I needed to do. And I think when you are in a management position, you're thinking about it all the time. You think about it in the shower. You think about it when you're exercising. You think about it when you're falling asleep. You think about it on your commute. And if you take that into a household, you know, I think it better describes whoever is that cognitive laborer, whatever their gender identity is, that person who's doing the majority of work in the home, it's really heavy and it weighs you down and it never goes away. It follows you on vacation. It follows you on holidays. It follows you on weekends. It's hard to get a rest from that. Do you find that Let's see. What if somebody thinks that they've signed up for that? Like, let's just say they're in their early 20s mm-hmm. and that that is the agreement that they had, that, that they're mimicking that structure. This is a young couple. And let's just say that in a heteronormative situation that the, the young woman, she wants to be at home, be with the children. She does not want to be out in the workforce. The man does want to be out in the workforce. They have met their match. They mm-hmm. have the same ideas. What happens 10 years later? Is the woman who signed up for it thinking, this is not what I signed up for? Because I've noticed in um, some literature that there's this discussion about women are the ones who are leading in divorce. 
And women are the ones who don't necessarily want to get remarried because the idea of being a wife does not appeal to them as much as for a man, marriage appeals to a man because you've got a lot of this labor force that's supporting you. So plenty of men want a wife, but not that many women want to be wives. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what happens when people go into an agreement when they're in their 20s thinking this is what I signed up for. And maybe there's some shame or lack of understanding or thinking, well, I agreed to this. And then they're in their 30s or maybe early 40s and thinking, no, 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 I, I can't do this. This is too much. I mean, I think relationships and just naturally shift and change, right? How, what you, what you agree on when you first come together might not be where you are in 10, 15, 20, 30 years around gender roles, but around all kinds of different things, you know, and the idea is to grow together and change together. And it's interesting when I interviewed, so for the middle section of my book, I interviewed 40 men who are already living as equal partners. A lot of those men who are say in their twenties and early thirties met their partner with these very specific equality objectives, right? They came into the partnership saying, we both want to work. We both want to have responsibilities in the home. We both want to be caregivers. And how do we make this work? A lot of the couples that I interviewed who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, we just talked about gender very differently in 1985 than we are now or 1995. And so when they partnered, they didn't have the same vocabulary around equality, nor did they have the same expectations, but they've grown together and they've sort of learned together and they've realized that gender norms are bad for everyone, right? And the same norms that were pushing maybe a woman to focus on caregiving might also be pushing a man to be super stressed at work because he feels like he has to earn a certain amount of money to validate his role in the family. And so I think that it's about growing as a couple and continuing that dialogue I've also interviewed people who, you know, frankly, get get stuck. I mean, I've interviewed a woman, I think she was in chapter four. And when she married, when they were dating, you know, she said, I'm a feminist and I always want to work. And he said, yay, me too. I feel the same way. But they didn't really dig down into the details and they didn't really talk about what cognitive labor is and what the reality looks like and what 50-50 actually feels like. And so they fell back into these patterns that they had been role modeled, had been role modeled to them before. So I do think that it ha- it can go both ways. I think that sometimes what you say in a conversation doesn't always translate into actions. And that just takes a very long commitment and dialogue together as a couple. I want to maybe hmm, for our listeners, um, we're using the term gender roles. I'm wondering if you could Maybe just give us a basic Mm -hmm. understanding of when people hear the word gender roles or fitting into a gender role, what does that mean? Especially now, there seems to be some confusion or even animosity around the notion of gender, this anger. So could we maybe give a definition of what that means? Of course. I, I describe gender roles are those, they're intangible, they're not written down, they're not really spoken. It's just sort of the implicit messages that you received growing up about how to be a boy or how to be a girl, right? It's like, girls, you know, don't sit that way. That's what I was told when I was a kid. My, I was often scolded, like, don't sit with your legs sprawled apart. Cross, cross your legs, sit like a nice girl, right? Sometimes it's verbalized. Sometimes it's just about how people react. You know, I've seen, um, I, I was at a playground last year and a little girl was having a fantastic time and got filthy dirty and ran up to her mom and her mom said, oh, you're as dirty as a boy. Let's go home and get you scrubbed up, right? So it's just these things that come to us in bits and pieces from our families, from television, from YouTube, from advertisements, from toy stores about how girls behave and how boys behave. And as much as we want to be equal and think that we have reached gender equity, there is still this unspoken underlying subconscious feeling that men should prioritize working and income generation and women should prioritize caregiving and taking care of a home. And that's not in every single family, but it's in enough families that it still feels fairly pervasive in our culture. And then let's just say if somebody were very traditional and were to ask you, what is wrong with that? What are the consequences to, I I see it in higher divorce rates. And actually there was an article in the Atlantic not too long ago. Sorry, Rudy, I'm going to mention sex, but there was this article. (laughs) I actually um, passed it on to my philosophy of sex and love. And it was called the bored sex. And it was that there was this assumption in terms of women are the ones who seek out monogamy. 
but actually women are getting bored in the bedroom in these long-term relationships and are seeking out something else. So this was talking about sexual intimacy, but the stereotype or the idea that women just want to be protected or provided for and that they are not sexual beings is the ramifications, the consequence of that is that you're having divorce or you're having, you know, very unhappy marriages. And I would see something similar because when I was listening to your book, I was actually in a long-term relationship where I did all of the labor. And when it ended, my life looked exactly the same, exactly the same. My place looked the same, all my day-to-day activities, nothing had altered other than it just felt like this weight had been lifted because I could do it all for me. And I think that there's a lot of women who do go through that. So for anyone, let's say, who's traditional is thinking, well, what's so wrong with these gender roles? I'm wondering, in, in my view, it seems like it's the end of the relationships. So relationships cannot sustain themselves that way. But in research, what did you find? If somebody were to say, so what? So what is the so First what? First of all, I would say that anyone who's comfortable with their life and their relationship, awesome. Like I would never suggest that anyone should change a working relationship based on anything that I've ever researched. I think that relationships are hard and it takes a lot of work. And if both of you are happy with each other and with your roles, that's great. And there are a lot of people that you know are quite happy performing the gender roles that match their sec- their identity and that's great for them. I think that the only time I push back is when I say they can be harmful for people when it doesn't work, right? So for example, my work is really important to me. My kids are really important to me, but so is my work. It fuels me, it makes me happy. It is something that I feel like You know, I wouldn't be a complete and happy individual without this part of my life. And if I was following strictly traditional gender norms, I wouldn't be able to do that. I think when you follow strictly traditional gender norms, you have more women out of the workforce, more men in the workforce. So your leadership is naturally going to be heavily male. And those are going to be the people who are making policies, making decisions for everyone else. And they only bring their male perspective to those decisions. And we don't have a women's perspective in the decision-making process. So I see, I can see problems at a household level and I can see problems at sort of a macro level as well. And I think it's interesting. I love talking about sex. I'll talk about sex all you want, but I think there's a lot of gender norms in sex and what, what we, you know, is it okay for women to have desires? Is it okay for women to initiate sex or different, you know, experimenting with different things? Is that make her bad? Does that make her dirty? Does that make her like, do you have to hide that part of you? And that's a big part of gender roles as well. I mean, we tolerate promiscuity in young men and we shame it in young women. And I think that's another really good example of gender roles. Rudy and I are both Gen Xers. So something I thought was interesting is, and Rudy and I have both experienced in our lives a real shift from the previous generation So what I thought was interesting was that you said millennials are not having the same level of a shift. So what is going on there? Why is it the Gen Xers change so much from their folks, but millennials are actually slow to change? Yeah. And I'm a Gen Xer too, so I'm right there with you. Uh, The forgotten generation, right? We talk so much about boomers and so much about millennials. So it was really the younger boomers and the older Gen Xers that made the shift. And that shift happened between 1965 and 1985, and it mirrors women entering the workforce in big numbers. And so we just saw a huge shift, I think, and it was a necessity. More women were working full-time and that just required more men to step into a household role. And so time journals, or sorry, chore journals between 65 and 85 showed a very big shift. 1965, male participation in the house was around 15%. 1985, it had risen to 33%. Since 1985, yeah, we haven't really seen much change. 1985, we were at 33% for male participation. 2020, 35%. So, you know, that's all of the younger Gen Xers and pretty much all millennials have not been able to make a dent in this. I think there's several reasons for this. I think one of them is people think this is as good as it gets. We had this major shift. Men today are doing so much more than their fathers or grandfathers. It's very typical to see a man wearing a baby Bjorn in the grocery store. And so we see these things and think we've made it. And if you think you've stopped, if you think you've finished the race, you're not going to run anymore, right? Because you think we've attained it. So I think that's part of the problem. 
And then I think a lot of people are perpetuating gender norms by accident. They do things and say things that keep women in that management position and keep men in that and I'm again, I'm also stereotyping, keeping one person in that management position that is most frequently a woman and keeping one person in that, you know, employee position that is very often a man. And it happens in same sex and queer couples. It also happens, can flip. I've interviewed plenty of couples where the man is the cognitive labor and his female partner is more the breadwinner um, and is a little more emotionally distant from the family. But I think that you know, it, it happens. And maybe if we're not seeing it, if we're not calling it out, we're not talking about it, we're probably not going to see a change. When I heard your analogy about the business versus the shift, I thought it was so powerful because it, it really did a great job of explaining it. And I'm wondering if a lot of couples aren't even being able to have the language to talk about what it is. So if a woman, let's just say, and again, this is a um, generalization in a heterosexual relationship. If a woman is saying that she feels like he, she needs more help. And then the man is like, I honestly don't know. I mow the lawn, like the intermittent stuff. I'm the breadwinner. I do all this. What do you mean? You, you're provided for, you have this home that they don't even have the language. So let's say for couples who are in a relationship or maybe couples who want to get in a relationship and we can do away with if they're just heterosexual, what's the kind of language that they should be using to have these communications about how to make their life good yeah. and so that they have a healthy and enjoyable life and they appreciate each other and they're there for each other? What kind of language that should they be I think using? that the, the thing it boils down to, and I have like, you know, questions to talk about with your partner when you're making a commitment when you're considering a child. And so you can find those in the book if you're looking for discussion questions. I think at the core, what it boils down to is an acknowledgement. Gender inequality is bad for both of us and gender equality is good for both of us. I think that for a while we've been focusing on, we need to make a change because it's better for women and girls. But the truth is, is that it's better for everyone. And I spent a good amount of time on chapters five and six talking about how men benefit from truly being equal partners in their home. And this reminds me of a story when I was finishing my dissertation. So this was years ago. My kids were two and five. So my kids were little. They were needy, like little kids are needy. I was finishing my dissertation. I was teaching three classes of undergrad and I was the alpha parent. So I was the one that was home more often. I was the one that did the daycare pickup at four and I had to stay home when someone was sick. And uh, my dissertation advisor asked me to turn something in a month earlier than was expected. And I had a complete breakdown because I was barely keeping it together day to day. And this new deadline moving up was just going to wreck me. And I very clearly remember sobbing on my kitchen floor, which was filthy dirty and made it even worse that I was sitting on this filthy, dirty kitchen floor. And my husband kept saying to me, how can I help? I want to help. And I just got so mad. <laughs> and I had the words. You mentioned people don't have the words. I had the words because I was writing a dissertation on the intersectionality of women's empowerment and masculinity. So I had the words only because I was in that space. And I said, I don't want you to help. I don't want to make you a list of things to do. I don't want to have to follow up. That's more work for me. I said, this is what's happening. Stereotypically across North America, Women are pushed to lean into the home. Men are pushed to lean into work. I said, our kids are little. I already see you leaning in at work, staying late, working on your career ladder, spending less time with the kids. And I already see me giving up professional opportunities because I'm so weighed down at home. I said, it's bad for both of us. It's bad for me right now, but it's going to be really bad for you in 20 years when you don't have a good relationship with your kids and you can't figure out why. And we need to change this now so it's better for both of us. And he really got that. And that started a dialogue between the two of us. And it eventually led to a book because I thought I had the words at that moment, but most people don't have the words. And so I think it always comes down to talking about how inequality is bad for everyone and everyone is going to suffer eventually. It might not be apparent today how each one of you is suffering or how each one of you will be harmed, but at some point in your life, it's going to appear and it's going to be painful. And so what can we do to even things out now so that we both have, you know, equal access to profession, equal access to caregiving, equal access to hobbies and health? I'm thinking about that to-do list. 
because that's that's true. I, one of the things that I had read is that the marriages or long term relationships are dissolving because the women are turning into mothers to their husbands and that decreases sexual desire as well. Yes. So the idea, so, I mean, you know, if you're picking up dirty socks for your kids and your husband, and then, you know, it's just, it's overall, it's just not, not, not sexy. Healthy. No. And then the women, of course, when they're doing all this, they don't feel like presenting desirable for sexual. So then they're getting blamed for why don't you fix yourself up or do this or that. But it's just this deterioration all around. I'm wondering if there, you know, I was thinking about when you said like this big shift in the 80s, I think it's also because so many laws changed in the 70s. So that by the time the Gen Xers went into the workforce, things like women, Title IX passed, women can be athletes. They don't have to just focus on having the boyfriend after school. They've actually got their own activities. Yeah, great point. You know, bank accounts. Yeah. So Gen Xers walked into a different world that was more welcoming to all sorts of opportunities. I still find myself as a Gen Xer that I'm somehow trapped in this in-between phase and where I grew up with all of these very strict gender role identities, but I was also encouraged to be educated and do my own thing. So it's like I'm somewhere in between these two things. I totally agree. Yeah, I was thinking about you made a reference to television and film and how it reinforced that. And I personally am fascinated by Lucille Ball hmm. because you mentioned Isla Lucy and I was thinking about that. But what was fascinating is that for the comedy to work, there had to be these strong gender roles and she had to kind of step outside of them, make her body into a joke, which was a very different thing for a feminine for a woman to do, to not be feminine, to throw her body into the joke. So here she is presenting these strict gender roles, but behind the scenes, she's the CEO. Mm -hmm. And even Desi Arnaz, years later in the 70s, he was on Johnny Carson and Johnny Carson said something like, you two had this show. And Desi Arnaz said, that was all Lucy. When people have asked, I mean, he credited her with it. He said, when people have asked, I might not get this 100% right. What was that show? He said, if you counted me and the producers and all the other actors and everybody on set, it was still 90% Lucy. So I always thought that was really fascinating. I'm sorry, that was a bit of a tangent. Well, I'm thinking, since you were talking about TV and film, is there TV and film today that is presenting an image of the family dynamic or relationship structure that you think is healthy and is forward moving? Is there something that stands out to you? Let me think about that. You know, it's interesting that you talked about your own growing up in the 70s and 80s and being stuck. And that's exactly what my experience was too. It's interesting to hear you say that. I was... I was raised, it's like, you can be superwoman. That's what I always thought. It's like, yes, there are all these strict gender norms. We're really not going to question them. But if you work really, really hard and really, really long hours and you're really, really smart, you can overcome it and you can have it all. And that was sort of what I was taught. And so I think I still fall into that. Just get your put your head down and work harder and you're going to get through it. And I think that that's changing for younger generations and I'm glad. And in terms of sort of TV and movie, you know, who do we see? I think we've seen a really significant change in the last 20 years around female role models. I think we're seeing strength. We're seeing decision makers. We're seeing leadership in female roles. Um, I think we still sexualize women way too much. So she might be a leader and she might be a decision maker, but she still wears a skin tight suit. I was just watching a Marvel film with my daughter over the weekend and there's a CIA agent character. And I even said, I said, that character would never wear that dress. She wouldn't wear three inch heels and have a skin tight shift on. She'd be wearing a shapeless black suit the way that all government (laughs) workers wear, you know? So I do think that even though they might be showing some attributes of strength, we're still sexualizing them, which is unfortunate. And I think body image plays into that a lot. I think where we could make the most change is in the portrayal of men, because we still use that buffoon Desi Arnaz, like that joke dad. I mean, I still see it in sitcoms all the time about the dad who fumbles and bumbles and gets the laughs because he can't get dinner on the table in time for all the kids. Or, you know, at the end of it, the lesson is mom's going to swoop in and save the day. And I really think we just need more examples of TV and movies that reflect our reality, which is men are perfectly capable of being caregivers. 
men are wonderful fathers. Men can show up and be there. They can know who the pediatrician is. They can know everyone's schedule. They can get everyone to places on time without messing up. It might not be the norm yet, but if we don't normalize and set examples, how are we ever going to make improvements? Mm -hmm. Advertisements work that way too. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if part of the pushback or the difficulty in seeing a shift is that the woman is equated with being morally good when she is achieving all of these domestic tasks. And so that is an advertisement for beauty products, Mm -hmm. right? To be your best self, you have to constantly look young and work at it. You put a lot of work into your Mm -hmm. appearance. Mm -hmm. And then same thing to look healthy, quote unquote healthy, when really it's just like a lot of manufactured stuff. Mm -hmm. And then same thing with the domestic space, that it's not just a matter of a division of labor, but that's what it means to be a good woman. Mm -hmm. And so letting go of that, I think is hard. Yes. Because it's it's a it's a moral shift or like if you're not yeah, if you're not doing serving the man or doing these things, you are not a good woman. I completely agree. I think that you can be it's harder to be a good woman perhaps than it is to be a good man. Or at least when you're talking about a domestic space. I think that we have now integrated women into the professional space and we are creating opportunity there. I don't think we're equal yet, but we're getting there. But there are still these norms that are weighing us down about what it means to be a good woman. And I I wish, I mean, that's sort of the, the ideal is that we get away from good women, good men, and just talk about good people. You know, I don't talk about what kind of son do I want to raise. I think about what kind of kid do I want to raise? What kind of person do I want you to be? Thinking about human characteristics, you know, Everyone can exhibit strength. Everyone can exhibit compassion. Everyone can exhibit empathy. Aren't these the characteristics we want to see in everyone as opposed to trying to label or code something as feminine or masculine? Rudy, I'm kind of curious. So Rudy's Rudy's wife, Dr. Madoran, is a general surgeon and Rudy's a lawyer. So I'm kind of curious with your two, do you do like the birthday stuff or who's in charge of like holiday presents? And or doctor's appointments. Uh, you're putting me on the spot. Here. I am, um, and that's okay. I don't mind being put on the spot. So, so I'm part buffoon, <laughs> uh, and but I'm also part uh, really, you know, involved father. And I, and I can't help it. I'm just bad at certain things, even though I try really hard. I, I will try anything. I mean, you know, I'll I'll try to do anything that uh, I am I am asked to do but I but I will just say I'm, I'm not gonna go down the rabbit hole of why I'm a buffoon in the household but I sometimes identify with those dads it just so happens but I will say that you know as the person who has the most flexible schedule because my wife's schedule is so ironclad um, a lot of everything falls on me uh, a combination of me and, and our nanny there's no way that my wife and I would be able to have her be a general surgeon on call all the time and me be a partner in an international law firm practicing at the level that I'm at without domestic help. And, you know, I, we, we've got to give a big nod to uh, having that help. You know, thankfully, we're in careers where we can afford that. That said, our domestic help isn't comfortable doing a lot of things. You know, English English is not her first language. So a lot of things have fallen on me and my flexible schedule. And I've stepped up, you know, mo- mostly without complaint and will do whatever is needed to be done. And I, I, I didn't grow up that way. I grew up with my dad. I didn't, I didn't even know my dad. I mean, I didn't even see him, never really talked to him until I got older. And I had my mother living at home and and she eventually went back to work when I was like in 10 or 12. Um, I had my grandmother there. I mean, we're Middle Eastern. We come from this traditional background. So it's not like I grew up seeing the, seeing this balance that you were talking about, like in the eighties or anything, but I just knew that I couldn't agree more with you, Kate, that uh, gender equality is a benefit to everybody. I mean, having women earn as much as they as they possibly can to have that equity, to have that parity helps the family out, helps helps everybody out. I mean, who wouldn't want that? Like that's like, why why wouldn't I want my wife to earn just as much as everybody else, even though she's probably working harder, you know, than than everybody else and and is treated. I mean, so that is just kind of like my view of it. Like, I guess it's selfish. I, I stand to benefit from it. You know, and our family stands the benefit of it. Our children, our grandchildren, our our parents. When equality is there, when I can help out in the household, and she can get paid what what she's she's earned, and when we help each other out, we make it. It's not perfect, but we make it work. 
you know, I, I think it's, I think it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in a unique, I'm in a unique situation. I mean, I'm not in a, in a normal situation because of our mm-hmm. career. So I'm not the norm, but even if I was the norm, I, notwithstanding my, buff, my buffoondom, I would still work my ass off to try to strive for some kind of parody because that's what's fair is fair. Yeah, and also you'd want your children to have, like when you envision your children grown, like don't you see them, do you envision them in relationships that are equal? I mean, I hope that for yeah. my daughter. Like I don't want, Absolutely. it's so funny because when I think about the gender roles, but I wouldn't want for her to grow up and to feel like her life was of service to somebody else who didn't support her, you know? Yeah, I mean, I would I would not want that. But, but you know, as Kate, as Kate said earlier, we're, we're not here to pass judgment upon anybody's relationships. If they're happy and it's working and people have certain roles, hey, you know, good for you. You know, that's, you got to remember, I think we all have to remember here, hopefully, you know, God willing, even, even if we get to equ- some kind of equality someday, hopefully we will, um, people can make choices about what kind of career they want, what kind of relationship they want, what kind of service that they want. And I'm not here to pass judgment upon what how people want to be or service in a relationship. You know, I've got a lot of friends who have had that conversation with their significant other and they just decided to, together, you know what? I want to raise the kids. I do not want to have domestic help. My career is on hold. This is what's important to me. Hey, that's terrific. God bless you. That's great. That's their choice. So long as they get a choice, like a fair choice. And that's where I'm like, yeah. uh, mm, okay, how fair was that? And I think the problem is w- women are not getting paid enough. So men are like, okay, well, I'm making more, so you stay home. So, that, so that's, that's and a problem. And it's an endless cycle. I'm no, sorry. no, that's a really good it's point because cycle. women make less, less money on the dollar than men, especially women of color. So then when one person has to stay home, it's going to be her because she's making less, he's making more. Because she stays home, right. she has, she's not further away from her income reaching potential. And he's focused on climbing the ladder and she's leading away from work. It's just this endless cycle. So I do think that Absolutely. if we want true equality and pay, then we need to break that cycle. There are so many things that you said, Rudy, that first of all, I'm glad that you, I love it when people are honest about their help and having a nanny, you know, like there are a lot of couples that the only way they can make it work is to have a nanny and that if they can afford that, but let's not pretend that nanny is not there. Like let's make her part of the conversation and be really open about what people need. Or, you know, my in-laws live down the street and will watch our kids at a moment's notice. That's a really important asset that we need to call out and talk about so that it doesn't appear that we're doing more than we are. Um, I think it's really honest to talk about the help that we have. And I'm also really glad that you mentioned that it's kind of selfish, right? And that's what I, when I interviewed my EP40 for the book and I said, what's your motivation? Like, why do you do what you do? You could spend Saturdays on the golf course. You could get away with that because it's tolerated, but you don't, you choose something different. Why? And they said, it's for my own benefit. I'm happier living this way. I have a better relationship. I have a more romantic relationship with my spouse. I have a better sex life. I have better relationships with my kids. One thing I hear a lot, I have less stress. I don't feel like I have to earn a certain amount of money to be part of my family. And I hear a lot of men say, I get to be my own self. I don't have to perform masculine. I don't have to pretend to be the big, strong guy who's going to take care of everything. I'm just part of the team like everyone else. And that there's a great sense of relief for a lot of men to just be taken who they are and accepted who they are, as opposed to being the in control, nothing's going to bother me. I'm going to make a certain amount of money every year. Yeah. I, uh, the focus on the word mm-hmm. team, you know, I don't know if, um, they use that enough in discussions of marriage. I mean, it's a team sport, right? You got to manage the kids. You got to shuffle them around. You got to, you got to, okay, well, how can I help you in your career? How can you help me in my career? What can we do? What kind of help do we need? Like, what are you really good at? What am I really good at? Let's maximize um, everything. I mean, it is, I mean, it's a team effort, you know, that the, on, in a team and a sport team, you have certain pre- people that are good at certain things. And I, I think you, you need to talk about maximization and, and efficiencies there. So yeah, I, I love that you talked about the word team. I just, a relationship is, is teamwork. It is. Right? And it leads to better sex. That's what I heard, Rudy. You heard teamwork. I did not say I, that. I, I did heard, not. I am not. I'm see, pretty I, sure. This is ridiculous. You got some data. Kate, Kate, she's Kate, she's she's over, data. I did not. This is, <laughs> this is ridiculous. That's what she, that I did not say that word. I'm not allowed to say that word, Kate. It's an ongoing um, joke. On so this Gary Barker, Gwen, Gwen's obsessed. Gary with Barker it. is the uh, 
founder and director of Equimundo, and he's been doing masculinity's work for 30 years. And I interviewed him for the book. And one thing that he said is, yes, equality in the household, we have data to show that it can lead to a better sex life, which goes back to what Gwendolyn was saying is that, you know, if I... Am I bitter that my partner's not pulling their weight? If I'm frustrated, if we have this naggy relationship, if we have this supervisor employee or this mother child, that's not hot, right? And so, and so if you no, have this, if you not. have a, this team where you're both tired, but you're both pulling your own weight, you're both in this together. It does, we, you know, there's, there is research that shows that that can lead to a better sex life. But Gary's very funny. He always points out, he's like, it's not transactional. If you carry the laundry up the stairs on Saturday afternoon, that does not lead to a hot Saturday night. This is an overtime <laughs> sort of pattern. It's not, I did this, now give me this. It's about a long-term pattern. So I always like to bring that up as well. Make it clear. That, that that's, gr- <laughs> that's great. That, that, that's fantastic. It makes a lot of sense. So, um. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed reading what I did of your book. You know what I really loved about it was when you were talking about those men mm. in Indonesia, how, how great it was uh, about the, they got out of the cycle of borrowing and the cycle of debt because their wives were able to, you know, they mm-hmm. were like making fruit mm-hmm. or snacks yeah. or something like that. That really spoke to me. I'm just curious to, to hear if, I really hope this doesn't, this doesn't sound terrible. Is this problem, Kate? more of an international problem or a U.S. problem? It is a human problem. <laughs> and I think I have, I have not found God, gender okay. equality anywhere. I think it looks, look, it looks different from place to place. And there's different issues in different places. But okay. I haven't found – I think Sweden probably has the most gender-forward policies, you know, maybe Denmark. But I've worked throughout Asia and Africa and now the United States and Canada. And I think that we're all still struggling and we all still have work to do. Okay. I, I just, I, I come mm-hmm. from a Middle mm-hmm. Eastern background. Uh, so I think, so, so already I was in a hole. Think about how like amazing I am, like just the culture, uh, the <laughs> Middle Eastern culture and how that is. And that, that's how, that's how incredible I, I, I am is that I've, I've surpassed that. Rudy, what was that I one? Usually, Did you say something I under your breath? I usually am thinking about how amazing you are. That's like... <laughs> Like just doubling down. Be amazing. The, when I when I wake yes. up, that's the first yes. before I do my daily affirmations. <laughs> As you should. I think that As is her should. daily affirmation. Is Rudy is amazing, and you know I invited yes. first generation Americans to my research on purpose because I wanted you know I had a Bangladeshi American, I had someone from I think um, Brazil, uh, Afro Caribbean, West African. So I had several people who did not grow up, were not born in the States, and but are now, now American. And it was really interesting to hear their stories of sort of how they kept their culture, but also assimilated and how they can interpret gender equality into their own culture. You know, I had a couple Muslim men who said, you know, it's not about what's in the Quran, it's how we interpret it. And they were able to find in the Quran, you know, scripture that encouraged them to find gender equity, you know, in their home and in their partnerships. But it, that was just fascinating to hear about their path and, you know, learning and sometimes some frustration. The the man that I interviewed from, from the Caribbean just said he grew up with incredibly staunch norms around masculinity and, you know, men do not really participate in caregiving. And he found that really frustrating and he had an emptiness because he didn't know his father very well. And he now has an infant with his partner and he's just so excited to create a different relationship with his new daughter that he didn't have for himself. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, not to put my, not to throw my dad under the bus here. Uh, you know, he didn't I mean his, you know, he didn't, his dad lived in another country and he didn't even really know his dad, but I can tell you right now that my part of one of the reasons why I'm so involved in my children's lives is because I want them to know me because I didn't know my dad. You know, he was an immigrant. He worked many jobs. He, he did what he could do. You know, but yes, you know, so I'm, I'm glad that you talked to those first generation then, and they actually said like, hey, I didn't have this, so I want to make things different. And so, yes, me too. I yeah. didn't have that. And I, I that's why I, it actually pushes me yeah. to make things different. Yeah. And a few second generation Americans who had the very similar story is sort of my parents came over and had to work crazy long hours just to keep up. 
And so just because they were never in the house, because they had to provide for us, I didn't really have that relationship. And so, you know, we always want what's better for the next generation. Like whatever we had, we want to somehow improve upon that for our own kids. And I think one way a lot of men want to improve is it's not things to give them, but it's love and affection and care. Absolutely. Well, on that note, Kate, thank you so much for your time. I think we'll wrap up there. Kate, thank you. Thank you for joining us. This was really awesome. Congratulations on the book, by the way. It's a really big deal. I appreciate that. It was lovely to meet both of you and have this conversation. And anytime you need anything at all, please reach out. Good is in the Details is produced by Dr. Gwendolyn Dolsky and Rudy Salo. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts and you're enjoying the show, please scroll down to the bottom and hit that five-star review. And remember to check out our show notes so that you can join our Patreon, get extra content, and join our book club. Patreon.com slash good is in the details. Also check out the show notes for a link to Kate Mancino's work. If you'd like to get in touch, join our Instagram, good is in the details pod. And you'll definitely want to hit a follow button for that because we have got a giveaway coming up. And in 2023, do you have a book or a film or a project that you would like to promote? Get in touch. Good is in the details pod at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Okay. Until next time. Bye.